endeavors. And also there was some modification about timescales. The reasonable endeavors was enforced for one month in May, then it was extended for June. We don't know what's happening next. The um, some modification in timetables for reviews, et cetera, what goes on to the 25th of September. Um, there's been mixed reactions to that. As a provider, as a representative of providers, I think we had to have some flexibility. But of course, disability organizations and parents' organizations have been very concerned this could be a slippery slope. Local authorities could begin not to do proper duties for those students with SEND. So there's been some tension over that, but that's how it stands at the moment. Okay, next slide. And then we had the guidance for SEND in the reopening of schools and colleges. And basically, in a lot of words, it said students with EHC plans or SEND without plans should experience the same phase return as their peers, although there might need to be additional risk assessment and additional support. And for those attending specialist provision, a phase transition in, um, priority given to those who would most benefit, there was a recognition some families were finding it very hard to cope with their young people if they had extreme behavioral issues. Also those who are key transition points. But there was an acknowledgement that return depended on safety considerations and particularly on transport, which we begin to recognize was a huge issue. Okay, that's the, a quick run through the guidance we've had. If you could go on to the next slide. Now, these are some of the asks that we are being, beginning to do, and this with AOC and NATSPEC working together, and just to say AOC and NATSPEC always work closely together, but we have particularly, in fact, we're on the phone with each other every day because we recognize we have far more strengths together. Um, we were talked to a lot of colleges would talk to us about what about students who are in their final year? Would they need some kind of extension? And the general feeling was, yes, they might need a bit of extra time, but this certainly shouldn't be a blanket extension. We were worried we don't want special schools saying we're keeping all our final years back because what that will do to numbers anyhow. And also that it probably wasn't needed. But we did realize that some final year students, not all of them, might need a bit of additional help, an individualized program to support them into their next placement, whether that's independent living, whether it's moving into employment, whether it's moving into um, social care, whatever. And some local authorities have already written this into their plans. And if anyone wants to see the Hertfordshire one, which is very good, I can send it to you. They've agreed it should be shared. We took this to the DfE and we have now got confirmation that students on supported internships will be able to have some additional time. It's not expected this will be a whole year. I think it'd probably be wrong if it was, but there will be funding from ESFA for them to have some additional time to support them into their work placement. Um, we don't yet know, and we're pushing on it, whether the DWP funding, which of course helps with students on supported internships, will be available. We also just yesterday, NATSPEC and AOC, had some notification from the DFE that implied they would also be pushing for some very flexible short-term extension for some students who were not moving into supported intern who were not on supported internships, but moving into other um, placements in the future. So that's where we've got to with that. Okay, next slide. Um, there's been an awful lot of talk about vulnerable students and an awful lot of confusion over who is vulnerable and what vulnerable means. The government definition of vulnerable was those with the HC plans and those with social workers and colleges knew immediately they had far, far more students who were in some ways vulnerable, including the very many with he mental health difficulties, those with autism, those with SEND, but without a plan. Um, there was a strong government pressure to have all vulnerable children and young people in school or college. They were concerned about those who were susceptible to online abuse. They were concerned with those who might have family abuse. Um, we, we responded very much saying, 
maybe that would be true of young children, but actually the ones they were most worried about, and those are those who have, um, you know, who maybe have been in alternative provision, um, don't have the best of attendance at the best of times. And actually they're the least likely to come in when none of their peers are in. And what we've been pushing very hard, and I think now they have begun to accept, is that what matters is engagement, not actual attendance. And again, I think colleges have put in place some excellent support for students. Um, I know of several colleges, I'm sure some of yours, who have support assistants or college staff ringing people two or three times a week, sometimes even every day, texting them, Skyping with them. Um, and in many cases that has worked. Of course we are concerned there were some students who will slip away. Um, and we are concerned that when these students come back or A, how will we get them back? We're particularly concerned about the um, school leavers who should be moving into college. There will be the effect of having had a long period of unstructured time. A lot of the students will have had probably economic problems at home. They will, uh, you know, quite likely have suffered some, some sort of bereavement. Although I think it's important not to get too self-fulfilling a prophecy of everybody's going to be damaged because it has been interesting, and I'm sure some of your colleges will endorse this, to find that some of those who have never fitted into the education system, who a lot of those who've been in alternative provision, who've been excluded, actually their engagement has been better online. And I think we've got to learn from that too. So there's a whole mixture of what we will have to deal with or learn from when people eventually come back to college. Okay, next, oh yes, and just to say, in addition to that, I did just see a report from Cooth, a very good mental health um, online uh, support for young people, and a lot of college students use this, that they have had a very high increase of young people from black and ethnic minority groups actually asking for counseling support. So I think there is an added anxiety there and, and we all know the reasons for that. Okay, next slide. Um, I wanted to just tell you about the resources that are available. AOC has carried out webinars on SEND, webinar on online safeguarding, and we're halfway through a series of six webinars on mental health support. These both have voluntary sector input and also a lot of input from good practice that's happening in colleges. And they're very good, the ones I've seen. Um, they're all recorded. And if you go on AOC website, you can get hold of them. And one great thing about webinars is that I think they've reached a far wider group of staff. Support staff can see them, everybody can see them. They're an hour and a half each. So do look at those or share them with your staff. And there are also on the, web, web, on the AOC website a lot of teaching and learning and support resources for the full range of students, some of whom are students with SEND. And NatSpec, who we're working with so closely, have also carried out a series of webinars and support, particularly for those with more complex needs, and they've got some resources. And th these are all openly and freely available on the NatSpec website. So there are a lot of resources out there. Just wanted to mention the College Collaboration Fund. The closing date's 28th of June, so it's a bit late, but um, there's 5.4 million competitive grants from the DfE for colleges to work together and share good practice. Um, it is very late, but I just wanted to say that the areas which they're interested in coming into this do cover both high needs and mental health. So if your college is putting in, you might just have time to say, what about sharing of good practice with high needs or with mental health, although the closing date is on Friday. Okay, next slide. Um, the AOC, and this is for all students and adults, has put in a very large recovery plan to the ministers, to DfE. There seems to be a general recognition that FE colleges are key to the recovery of education and training, both for young people and adults, and there will be a huge need for this. Um, there is a recognition of the effects of lost learning and the particular challenge of those from disadvantaged backgrounds, of whom we have a lot in FE, those with additional learning needs, whether they've got a plan or not, and those with emotional or mental health difficulties. Um, we have met, put particular asks for more resources to support those 
um, who've yet to achieve good grades in English and maths, those who are likely to need more support, and also the, the extensions I've already mentioned, those with high needs, and for those school leavers who are moving to college who might get lost having had five months out of education. We've been incredibly disappointed, as I'm sure everybody in colleges has, that the recent announcement about additional funding doesn't mention colleges at all, it only mentions schools, and I, I think we all feel that is outrageous. We're still pushing very hard. I think we'll certainly get things for the adults, for the apprentices, how much we get actually for the ones who are so important, 16 to 19, I don't yet know. But certainly um, the battle goes on and David Hughes, our chief exec, is pushing very hard. I think the problem is with the treasury that, you know, we, we have ministers who are supported, we have a DfE who is supported, but we are not yet getting the additional money that we really will need. We didn't put in, different categories there, mental health, additional learning needs. We wanted colleges as far as possible to have flexibility to use additional resources. They know what their students need, who they are, and they need to use it in the way that best suits those young people. Okay, a couple more slides. Next one. Um, we had a SEND policy meeting. The AOC runs policy groups, and I run one for SEND that Pat is on last week. We did have four DfE officers there. Our really strong asks were we wanted some underlying principles. At this stage there was no announcement about what would happen in September. We recognized it was hard to say and I think we still don't know what will happen in September. Will be, there be an attempt to get everybody back full time? Will there be blended learning? We just don't know. But we did need some underlying principles for post-16 SEND. And particularly, we asked DfE to give us support in working with local authorities in over transport. Then it was two meters. Even if it's one, this means a lot more buses. We can't teach students if they can't come in. Um, there is still a concern, particularly if we go on with some of the support being at home, that despite government promises, a lot of SEND students don't have access to appropriate technology. And it's very hard for their families to support them if they don't have this. And we also were concerned that a lot of colleges were saying there was even more than delay in usual in reaching funding agreements for 2021. So those are the three very strong asks we've asked from DfE to support us with. Um, I just want to say a word if the next slide. We also, and this is not particularly COVID related, this is an ongoing issue is high needs funding. We all of us in colleges know that the high needs funding system as it stands has never worked for colleges. It, it is detrimental in many ways. So what we did before lockdown was AOC, NATSPEC and the Local Government Association all put in some money to fund a small research project on high needs funding. And we appointed the ACL consultants to carry this out. They're very good. They did a lot of work with Kent local authority when there were problems there and they do know the sector very well. Um, they have been doing interviews with local authorities and with providers across the country. Their main findings, which we know, is it's too bureaucracy heavy. Um, the threshold for element three is too high. What this means is an awful lot of students are being assessed just below element three. Colleges are having to use their disadvantage fund to fund students who should be having high needs funding. There isn't enough for that very wide and important range of students who need less funding but are still so crucial. They've made various suggestions. We asked them to really be quite radical in their suggestions, which included some sort of block funding direct to colleges for element two lowering the element three threshold and also one of the proposals was getting rid of element two altogether and this was where pat came in as pat is a very vocal and important member of that group said why can't we return to the additional those of you who were in colleges then will remember pre the children and families act we had additional learning support funding for send learners which was managed nationally and in many ways worked much better Russell Ewins, who is in charge of post-16 high needs funding, was at the meeting. He's keen to work with the researchers. And 
there is a DFE send review, an internal review going on. So it just might be we are at the situation where we can get some changes. Although sadly, I don't think they'll be in place until 21, 22. But I just wanted to say we haven't given up on changing the high needs funding because we feel it's crucial, not just for the students who get it, but for all the many of those who don't get it. Okay, that's it. If you could just go on to the last, I hope I haven't gone over. Um, I'm sorry, my PA, for, she's brilliant, normally has put a, um, a spelling mistake in my name. It's A-Y at the end, not E-Y. It's right at the beginning, it's wrong here. And just to say, just yesterday afternoon, quite late, I got an email from Maria Elise, who we deal with in DFE, saying they're producing guidance on what a full return to school stroke colleges for SEND learners could look like. They are drafting this now. It hasn't begun to go to ministers, but they're sending it to a lot of us, AOC, NATSPEC, and several schools organizations first to comment on. So this is our chance to get things in there. There won't be time, and I think it's confidential anyhow, to get it out to all of you. But as I said at the beginning, what I would like is email me with the correct spelling of my name. And what are your concerns about a return? what do you think will be needed? What would be your policy ask? So I can try and incorporate some of those into the draft they're producing. Okay, sorry if I've gone over, that's, that's it. Okay, Pat. Um, you're fine, Liz. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Yes, thanks, thanks, I can see some nods. Um, could we take down the um, presentation, please, Scott? Um, now, there have been some questions. Uh, Scott, are you in a position to field? I've seen a couple. One from Jane Bellington, EHC's funding for the rest of the year. Do you mean 2021? Uh, no, I'm afraid I don't. I meant it was for the rest of the summer term. Of course, the funding for next year will depend on your agreements with the local authority. But I think we will certainly be pushing. We get that same assurance that if, as is likely, we have periods of lockdown, periods when students aren't coming in, if you've got an agreement, you are still supporting the students. We want to get that. We would want to get the same agreement for 2021. Okay. Um, can I ask colleagues to come in, um, if you just raise your hand and we'll bring you in, on any colleges that have actually got their agreements and are happy with them? Sorry, for 2021. Pat, can I... Can I just mention that I'm still trying to resolve 1819 from a high needs funding perspective. So sorry, 2020. Who's talking? I oh, sorry, it's Sarah Legood from Derby College. Hello, Sarah. Yes, go ahead. That, that we're still trying to resolve 1819 funding. So 2021 seems extraordinarily optimistic, even though it is only a few months away. That is appalling. And I mean, are you in touch directly at all with the DFE? Because I don't want to be flooded, but anybody who is having really extreme problems with their local authority, I do sometimes forward these to people in the DfE who deal with local authorities, and I'm happy to do that. I, I have raised a formal um, concern through our ESFA partner, um, okay. but it's and now resulted in a, a total capping of element two places, regardless of numbers. If you send own. that to me, I could send it. I'm not saying it'll do any good. It's always this difficulty. The DfE so often say we can't tell local authorities what to do. And that's the whole problem with this, which is why, as Pat says, we want something mm. that's direct. But if you do send it to me, because that does seem extreme, I could send it to Andre Image, who is supposed to be the person who deals, who is the liaison between DfE and local authorities. Thank you, Liz. Anybody else? So I'm assuming nobody has their funding agreed. Oh, sorry, two hands up. Can you see who they are, Scott? Uh, yeah, let me bring them in. Bring them they in, please. Um. Jane and... Sorry, I don't know the first name, A. Robinson. Uh, if you want to come off mute, you can um, talk. 
Um, I'm Jane Bedlington, Luton Sick Form College. Um, I've been to about four or five panel meetings with two local authorities over the last, well, since we've uh, had lockdown in March, and had the last one yesterday, and uh, everything was finalised. Uh, quite laborious and long winded, but uh, quite fair. Uh, we work mainly with Luton and Central Kids. So it is possible. It yeah. is possible. It's hard work, um, but we have pretty good relationships. They're very, I mean, they scrutinise, which is fair, and that's what they're meant to do. Um, I had to come back with a number of uh, queries, and they also got me to do some uh, collaboration work with another college where a student hadn't made a decision exactly which one, which course to do in two colleges in Luton. And I have a good relationship with the Further Education College, and together, uh, the two Senkos got together um, and we did a comparative costing. Uh, and actually, it was a very good exercise to do that comparative costing for two colleges, which we then submitted, um, during which time the student had made a decision. Um, but actually, as a process, was really helpful. And I think fair, actually, because it is public money and they did need to decide whether our costs, which were, I think, £3,000 higher in the Sixth Form College than the Further Education College, um, were a good use of public money. So, although it's pretty hard work and uh, they really do pin you down, it was fair. Good, good, Jane. That's good to hear. Um, so also, somebody's on, on the chat, um, TJ Davis, that confirmed 20 to 21, but I'm assuming most of you haven't confirmed. You know, you really have to be vocal and you have to involve your MPs, you have to be political, you have to write those letters. Um, we've got a chance now, particularly with the review, to push things forward, but that will only happen if we have a galvanised um, approach from this sector. So do, you know, it takes 10 minutes to write a letter to your, to your MP um, and to... to you know, get people who understand in your community who can support um, our, our, our quest for funding because it isn't fair and it, it's wrong. Okay, I'm going to move on now. Um, if we uh, sorry, there's, there's... I will. As soon as I get off this call, I'm going to write to... I hope you're hearing me. It says my internet connection's unstable. Um, as soon as I get off this call, I'm going to email Andre Image and Maria Elise Howells, the people we deal with in the DFE, and say that at a meeting I've just come out of, there were 80 participants from across the country, and only two of them had had funding assure, assure, assured for September. That would be one. I don't think they know how bad it is. Yeah, I don't think so. That's why. But it's also important that you engage with your local. Mm. councils that you write to them that you write to the ceos of the councils and that you write to the politicians we need to we need to galvanize it okay mm. can we move on now scott there's just uh one other person i think with a hand up um a robinson i think yeah that, that's me sorry we haven't i i lost the connection slightly i thought you were asking if people hadn't got their funding sorted <laughs> i've just got a quick question back in february an agreement was reached as to how many high needs they thought we were going to have We've gone from 77, which is what they're saying they're going to fund us for next year, to 120. How do I get round that massive difference? Um, can I just answer some of that? Your principal really needs to write to the um, local council because um, you need some clarity on that. And you also need to inform the local council and have a meeting with them with some senior staff with you particularly your fd if you've got your financial director that's really important because actually you can't carry that cost you could carry one or two but your college which college is it it's molton molton yeah um get corrie to call me <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I just want to. At the moment. I got on Friday again. Are you dealing with Northampton or several of your several others? Um, there's several various others. ones involved. Northampton have got at least 100 of those 120. Okay. Oh, okay. I think. Um, well, you talk to Corey, but if she needs some advice on that, get her to call me. Liz, you were going to say something. I just want to say that 
of course, this is an ongoing issue where people usually do agree, do find agreements. It is when the principal and the chief executive get together. It shouldn't be like that, but often that is the way to get things done. Yeah. So don't be afraid to go to your principals and ask them not just to talk to the person who is dealing with the funding, who often doesn't know very much about colleges, but to deal with the chief executive. Yeah, Thank you. And, and actually, you know, Corrie will have a lot on her plate at the moment. So, it, you know, she needs to know that because that's a massive drain on resources. Okay. Oh, she's fully aware we're having big discussions about it at the moment. So. Okay, well, we'll, we'll give you a call and I'll, I'll advise her. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, I want to move on unless there's anything urgent because I'm just conscious of time but we will try and finish this meeting at 11.30. So if there's nothing, anything urgent, or we put it on the chat, um, I'd like us to welcome uh, Sarah, Elaine and Jane from our Centres of Excellence. They've prepared a presentation for us and I'm really pleased you're here and I thank you for your time. So I'll pass you over to, to them. I think Scott's going to upload the presentation. And Liz, thank you for coming. You, you've got to go now. No, you? no, I haven't. I'm staying. No, I want to hear. Mm. Great. Good you're here. <laughs> well, thanks, Pat, for the introduction. Um, I'm Elaine. I'm going to be leading on the presentation. And I hate um, when I'm trying to read and looking at the slides. So I'm going to turn my video off, if that's OK, so you can just focus on the, the, the slides. Um, so thank you very much, Pat, for welcoming us here today. The plan that we're going to walk through a couple of slides with you just to give you a, a little bit of update about what we're doing uh, for the three centres and what you can expect over the next year. So next slide, please, Scott. So if you could just click through all of this and stay on this slide, please, Scott. Thank you. Um, so just pause there, oh, just back a little bit, thank you. Um, so everyone is probably fully aware of the Education and Training Foundation. We've uh, popped a couple of links in there for you. There's the, the main gateway, the SEN homepage, but then the SEN Centres for Excellence page, which is where you'll see all of our upcoming events and webinars. But of course, within all of those links, there is quite an extensive amount going on, um, a considerable amount of resources. And if you're like me during this time, you're attending very many webinars, as I can see you are all here today doing so. So there's lots of activities and uh, excellent resources for you to access, but I'm sure you're fully aware of that. As well as you are aware that we have the three centers, Western Derby and um, myself in Norwich leading on these, uh, three themes. Next slide, please, Scott. Of course, for each, and if you can click on all of the three, thank you. They should have all come up together. That's my poor um, uh, management of PowerPoint. Sorry about that, everyone. So we have the leadership hub within the Centres for Excellence. And so this is for any leader. So for people out there, do not be put off to think this has to be a principal and CEO conversation with, uh, with either Paul, Mandy or Corianne. That could be any one of you that lead on the SEND department where you feel that you would really benefit talking to Paul about um, uh, people leadership and uh, the training, um, talking to Mandy when you're looking at the curriculum or for us, um, in Norwich when you're looking at working with employers, parents or within the community. So please take that opportunity up at any point. Next slide, please. And so over to Western now, next slide, please, because they're just going to give you a little bit of update and over to Jane on what they've been doing. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I'm Jane Vivian. I'm project managing the SEN Centre for Excellence at Western. Um, apologies, Sam, our head of inclusive practice, wasn't able to join us today. Um, as Elaine's already said, we are um, our focus of our um, SEN Centre is around people, and that's obviously our SEND learners, but also um, staff and um, contacts within our local community. Um, we've been doing a lot of work around mental health and well-being at the current time. Um, obviously, it's a, a key focus for for everybody. Um, I just thought it'd be useful to put the national context. Um, on, on the screen really um, to, to, to 
highlight the, I mean, these slides were put together prior to COVID-19 and I'll come on to that in a minute. But um, as you can see, one in four people experience a mental health problem in any given one year. Um, and actually, um, you know, that's, that's a significant amount of our working age population that's affected by mental health. Um, and only 25% of those people receive support each year. Next slide, please, Scott. Um, in terms of um, like mental health at work, um, I, th I thought it'd be really helpful to highlight how this is affecting the UK economy. Um, and again, these, these statistics were pre-COVID-19, so we anticipate the impact of um, COVID on mental health at work to, to to get a lot worse um, and obviously the anxiety that it's causing is having a, an impact on learners um, specifically send learners but also um, staff and you know a part of our centre is focusing on supporting those that support send learners um, as you can see here um, the annual cost of sickness for around mental health is 8.4 billion per annum um, and actually only 31% of the UK workforce have been formally diagnosed with a mental health issue. Um, and as you can see, mental health costs the UK economy 70 billion per annum. So that's, that's significant. That's a significant impact. And obviously, as I say, we're anticipating that's going to um, increase. And certainly the um, conversations we're having with learners um, and also um, people within the business community we're hearing that that is is significantly um, increasing so we're doing a lot of work at the moment through the send center to support people to support their learners and to support their employees next slide please um, this is a, a really um, I think really um, interesting and useful slide that Hertfordshire have put together around the impact of COVID-19 on mental health um, across each life um, sort of key area age within um, the life so preterm not five school years working age and old age and as you can see there um, what, what they've done is categorize some of the mental health issues and um, impact of COVID in each of those key categories and in terms of kind of staff you can see there that you know trauma isolation um, managing work from home and potentially um, bullying is is all part of you know kind of um, you know a, a massive impact of COVID-19 and as you can see um, if the economic impact is similar to the post to the 2008 recession we're anticipating an extra 500,000 additional people will experience mental health problems in the next year so as i've said earlier you know it is a key issue that we need to focus on next slide please so at western college um we've we've done a lot and actually um, there's a number of webinars that we've been running around supporting um, learners um, with digital technologies which Liz mentioned earlier how we've supported our SEND learners during this time to ensure that they remain connected to the college and, and gain the support that they've needed virtually um, but actually also we've had to do a lot of work around um, helping staff to feel confident and comfortable in supporting those learners. I'm sure all of you have experienced a massive change in how we've delivered education and, and support during COVID-19. And so everybody's been on a learning curve and obviously the primary focus is on SEND learners and our, our, our other learners to, to ensure that they feel as supported as possible. But that's led to a massive pressure and um, kind of impact for, for our colleagues and so actually a lot of the work's been around supporting um, our teams as well and as I said we've, we've run a number of webinars and actually we've heard from um, strategic partners and businesses that they felt that the, the impact of COVID-19 and they felt that they've needed to really kind of support people as well especially around that social isolation and that feeling you know a bit more vulnerable not, not being part of a team. Um, obviously, financial constraints are, um, uh, have been a key issue as, as well in terms of ensuring that the model of support has been able to, to be delivered within an, a, um, a, the financial constraints. What we've done is we've 
run a number of cross college events to raise awareness of um, body and mind BAM um, and also um, our, our principal has been um, he launched my virtual college he's done some webinars with AOC around that and it was all around kind of how we've supported staff and learners um, to make sure that they feel connected to the organization there's been a lot of informal um, communication um, and my virtual college um, monthly update that's sent to everybody as well as weekly updates we've run online activities there's been yoga classes there's been quizzes there's been so many things outside of just the education that's been delivered to ensure that people still feel um, connected you know sports have done the les mills they've run their own sessions we've had um, inclusive practice have done kind of um, mindfulness and you know it's, it's been fantastic actually and so whoever you are connected to the college you've been able to access a whole range of different things that have helped to support you and actually one thing i'd like to to talk about here that's been i think um significantly important is big white wall i don't know how many of you have or heard of it or use it but it's a service that we um subscribed to about two three years ago now and it's a 24 7 365 day a year kind of portal where you can go on and um find information about whether whatever you might be feeling so it could be anxiety it could be mental health it could be eating disorders it could be domestic violence or issues at home um, alcoholism so there's a whole everything that you can think of that might impact and affect mental health is on big white wall um, that complements our own welfare team um, support but actually what it does mean is it's anomalous so people can go on there they can find information about how they might be feeling before they speak to somebody um, and also post updates about that and sitting behind big white wall is a a team of trained counsellors so they manage that service and anything that was flagged to them they step right in so it gives us confidence that when our team aren't available out of hours there is a service in place to support our learners and staff that's something i just wanted to, to highlight there that all western college staff and all learners have access to that service next slide please so just a very quick one because elaine's already mentioned this um part of the SEND Centre for Excellence um, is the Communities of Practice Leadership Hub and also Employability. They're the three key component parts of it. Um, and um, there's a number of webinars and events that we're planning, which we'll come on to a bit later. Um, but all webinars that we've already recorded are available as a link on that website. Um, so please check them out. And if you want a list of what we've already run, please let me know. Thank you. I think that's it for me for now. <laughs> Scott, I think I think I'm next. So thanks, Jane. Do you want to just click onto the next slide for me, Scott? So morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah from Derby College Group. Um, I'm going to very quickly take you through what we've offered over the last year, what impact uh, I think it's uh, had on us and on the people that we're working with, and also what our plans are for the coming months. So um, exactly the same as the other two centres for excellence, we split our work into two key areas. One is around strategic leadership, and the other is around developing our communities of practice for operational leaders and anybody else working with young people um, to improve their experiences and their life chances and obviously impact ultimately on them progressing or getting a job. So Mandy, our CEO, um, leads a weekly activity where CEOs, senior leaders um, and managers from the post-16 sector, and I have to say that that is training providers as well as um, FE colleges, um, one of the challenges for us is to engage with training providers. So anybody that is a training provider or anybody that wants to share this with their training provider colleagues would be really welcome to do so. Um, and Mandy offers uh, kind of reflections on our journey. Um, our approach as the other two centres is very much focused on the fact that this is an ongoing journey and we're not there yet. So it is very much about learning from our peers and, and that's what appealed to us about be becoming part of the, uh, the centres. Um, Mandy talks very passionately and eloquently about the methods and the mechanisms she's used within our college to affect changes. 
So a key driver for her is around our strategy and the fact that every strategy in the college, the overarching one and all of the supplementary elements of that need to be inclusion focused and inclusion based. And she um, will come out to um, organisations or will do it virtually um, for the foreseeable future. She'll actually deliver, deliver design thinking training, which is one of the things that we've done around taking a, um, a challenge or a, um, a curriculum design issue for us and create a solution using all of the, the people, all of the stakeholders involved in that activity. Um, it's a five stage process, it's very simple. The other key thing that Mandy did, which we've used extensively, is she created or she uh, iterated the 20 key leadership questions that she asks us as leaders within Derby College to make sure that we are inclusive in our practice. And so we've shared those with the people we've been working with, and they often use them um, to inform what their urgent and emerging priorities are. Scott, will you nip onto the next slide for me, please? And if you just click through, so it, the next one part comes up as well. So I think that's it. So the communities of practice work we've done um, have been predominantly face-to-face -face and then offered in organisations. So we use an appreciative inquiry model and we've been delivering that with Anita Devi, who's a SEND specialist and uh, SENCO coach nationally. Um, and we do a two-day workshop. One is around starting with that positive and looking at your provision and mapping where you are, you are and celebrating the positives. And again, it's engaging and using everybody in the process to do that. And also to then look at um, how that impacts on our intent and how that goes back to informing strategy. And that's for every level of practitioner. So whether it's your learning support teams, whether it's your managers, whether it's your funding managers, it's all of those people. And that's been a real positive. Um, and the feedback, I've just put a quote there. It's been a real eye opener for us. Um, we're working quite closely with four or five colleges now over a 12 month cycle. So we're hoping to um, to kind of be able to share their, the impact that, that that project's had. Um, we've also built um, a, stu a personalised study programme guide, which the, um, the image at the bottom shows, and it's almost like an old fashioned flick book. So you go through it and you use it to unpack a study programme and repackage it for an individual. So rather than delivering a level two animal care programme, we may have one or two learners who are on a radically different study programme, still in the same room, still um, participating in the same academic work, but doing very, something very, very personalised to them. Um, and then the, sli the slide on the right, um, it's around the workshops that we've offered. Most of these have been face to face, but we're just in the process of swapping them over to virtual workshops. And the kind of overall intention around all of this is to really explore the fourth eye in the EAF, which is inclusion, and to really make sure that people are able to iterate that in their strategic plans, in their operational curriculum plans, and also to make sure that when Offset arrives, we are all able to iterate the fact that we work inclusively and we personalise learning for individuals. And it isn't just those young people with EHCPs. The project in the first year has really clearly been focused on the rest, not the EHCP students. So that's been a real, uh, a real positive for us. Scott, will you just click one more for me? Um, and just to mention that this is the kind of teacher learning and assessment COVID recovery plan that we've currently got in place. So we're working on um, expanding how inclusion wraps around each part of, the, part of this model. So all of our curriculum managers have been given five um, structured options on delivery and planning for September. And we as an inclusion service are now going to host an inclusive teaching and support day around these five models of delivery. There's still some research going on because it seems that the simultaneous model, although it seems very simple from the outset, will be very challenging, particularly for students with, um, with either, for our, in our case, uh, an inclusive learning plan or an EHCP. Um, we've had to radically review how we work with those students on the pre-learning model because they need support during pre-learning it's not just they do it independently because if that was the case they wouldn't need learning support in the first place um, and we have found that our 
um, substantial support teams have actually, um, I naively at the beginning of this thought there may be an opportunity to really flood them with some excellent CPD. And what I've actually ended up doing is paying overtime because they're working well above and beyond their scheduled support timetables. And it's been really significant for us. Um, and as Liz alluded to, the feedback has been absolutely excellent from, uh, from parents and young people and the other people supporting them. Um, so for Derby College, I think that the plan over the next 12 months is to really refocus our work. Obviously, some of it, that refocus will be the COVID impact. And most of it is a, very much around progression and that real journey into employability. Um, and that's going to be a key driver for us because the data nationally still is obviously not where we, any of us would want it to be. Um, there'll be another little bit at the end about what our immediate plans are. And I'm going to hand you over to Elaine. Thanks, Sarah. Scott, you all right to move on to the next slide, please? So um, Norwich's focus over the past year have been working and looking at community parents, but our greatest focus last year, and we've extended that into this year, is working with, uh, with um, partners and our employers. But currently we're working on getting students back to the workplace. So if we just move to the next slide, and then I'll just talk through what we've been up, uh, up to. So um, what's been quite interesting, and we took this information from Disability UK, is first and foremost, before I get on to moving learners back into the workplace, is uh, knowledge and understanding about what employers really want. Now, this was quite an eye opener for me when um, um, I took this information from Disability UK. So if we can click on the first link, please. So where you think actually employers would work, would want um, uh, certain uh, uh, skills from young people when they're looking at all of their attributes, they're actually talking about disability and uh, a greater percentage of employers were very, uh, very happy and well uh, would want to, to engage with learners with disability, but they just wanted to understand what the practical adjustments would be required. So again, it's about us, the sector, informing the employers. So 31% of those said that they needed that. Next clip, please. Um, what they also needed uh, to understand is 30% said that they uh, wanted additional support required to uh, learn and study so that they needed uh, to understand what that actually meant for our learners uh, to, uh, to require that extra time. So again, just knowledge and understanding around that. Next click, please. So what they also wanted to know about, and I'll show you um, our guide in a moment that um, I will share with you after this session, is additional support to help existing staff to support a disabled employee. So where we have a learner in the workplace, how to effectively uh, support um, a learner or young person in the workplace. Next click. Pastoral support was up there as well. And so when we're just thinking about uh, disability, it's actually for all of our young people in the workplace, understanding what that meant for the employer. So to give them the knowledge and understanding in that area as well. Next click. So perhaps it'd be helpful to click through all of these until you get down to the 5% and then we'll, I'll just read through these quickly. So a lack of skills and, and, and um, support, they didn't know uh, and have the information about disability. So it's about us helping and supporting, uh, supporting them. Financial approach and practical adjustments. So if we needed to make any reasonable adjustments in the workplace, how to support them with the Department of Working Pensions and how to apply for that, for additional funding that we would be able to support them if, if we were um, accessing element two and element three. 15% um, said that they didn't face any challenges and only a small amount said that they didn't know. So when you're looking at those statistics, actually it's quite encouraging, but it just goes to show that we have work to do for anyone who engaged with an employer in informing them about disability and supporting them. Next slide, please. So thinking about the barriers for employers, if we could just click through the first one, um, just pause there, just thank you, um, Scott, if that's okay. So we know that flexible working has been around for some time and, um, and employers have responded very well. 
Um, and obviously there's, that's been accelerated now during the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, and employers are adopting different processes and making many rapid changes. I think for us, what's really important is to have solutions for our, our employees, our learners are going to work in the workplace and to make sure that we have really good communication and more of that in just a moment. Next click, please. So um, we all have adopted, and I use crisis management uh, within this, where we've had to use techniques to enable us to ad adapt things really uh, quickly within the current climate. But of course, as we've heard here today, and you've all adapted very well, there are opportunities that have come out of this. Um, and there are many of our learners uh, learning very well online. We're all working online much more effectively um, and at a distance. And so there are developing opportunities that we need to exploit when we're looking at putting learners back in the workplace and what we might need to do. Next click, please. So mental health and well-being, um, as you've heard just a little while ago, uh, Western have um, highlighted actually the extent of, of data and we know that that's going to increase. I think our role is to support employers with having empathy, support and well-being for our learners in, in the workplace. Um, and of course, there, there will be lots of information coming out from Derby uh, for, for upcoming webinars. Next click, please. So the new employment landscape, well, the effects of COVID-19 crisis is uncertain and we know that it's going to be significant and many employers will be finding their way, uh, ways of working and their circumstances altered considerably. And I think there might be some very honest um, uh, conversations and perhaps some difficult ones that will need to take place. But our learners must know how to conduct themselves in the workplace and feel supported in doing so. And I think it's our role to help with that. And again, as I said, more about that in just a moment. Next click, please. But of course, we know that right now, um, we are attempting to navigate our way through this uncharted territory and actually doing quite well. So there is a change to the working environment. And we've seen even on the news uh, this morning about how businesses are making changes and adapting themselves within the workplace. So hopefully there will be some positive lasting change uh, within that. But we have an opportunity to support our employers with the experience, the support and uh, put risk assessments in place to uh, guide our learners in the workplace. Next click, please. Which I think just covers that last one. Thank you. So how are we going to support in the workplace? Next click. Oh, it's not come up in, perhaps click on all of them. Sorry about uh, that. And the last click is the first one I'm hoping. There you are. So we, we will be making sure that we have rotors in place um, for our learners going back into the workplace. And I am thinking about those not on work placements. I am thinking about our supported interns and we have a supported employment agency where, uh, where we get work for our uh, young people. So we will be looking at rotors to include very specific times with a work plan. We will be making sure that they are very clear about their designated work areas uh, when we're looking at that social distancing, although that's been relaxed slightly, but we still need to be mindful that the one meter needs to be very clear and where their designated areas are to reduce any risk of infection. What we will be doing is drawing up a support plan from the risk assessments that you've all been doing already and that all of us are very uh, well versed with, but sharing that with the employer and to put those reasonable adjustments in, in place within the workplace. And I think the critical part is to talk through with the young person, the learner and the employer of all of the above and to make sure that we're regularly reviewing that approach um, and support taking forward. And now um, I'm coming on to the inclusive um, guide, which is what I've been alluding to for the last couple of minutes. So if we can click onto the next slide, please. So we have um, this resource uh, here. Uh, within, within the ETF uh, website, there is a link to click on to our digital guide, and that highlights all different types of um, disability 
for an employer uh, it highlights um, how that they can um, how it might affect a learner and how they can support and so we have this on our website and when we go through learner uh, sorry employer induction we highlight this to our employers um, and we feel that this is an essential part where we have an induction process for our employers and even more so with the previous slide and going through those items. Um, this is also on the ETF website, but for ease and access, we've got a new inclusive toolkit that goes through all of um, the disabilities. It talks about how it affects a young person, as I've just said, and how an employer can help and put those things in place. Now, why have we got that, that in, in, um, in place? Well, if an employer, and you're going through induction, um, they might at that moment in time just think, well, actually, I do know about ADHD, I do know about ASD, but I want something to refer back to. Now I'm actually supporting this young person. I do need to um, fully understand that. And in the current climate of going back into the workplace, if you have a learner, that uh, I'm being very general here, who has ASD and being very specific about the action plan, being very specific about their uh, work designated areas, and perhaps the, the employer isn't so focused around that and there becomes a concern, well, the employer can re uh, respond, obviously, and go back to the toolkit to ha have some knowledge and understanding and how to best to support um, uh, to support the learner. Next click, please. So we have other toolkits uh, within this booklet that you can access. Um, and so there are uh, quite a few um, uh, additional toolkits uh, within there. I won't go through all of those, but I just think they, um, they are uh, really helpful and we've used those extensively over the past year and bringing them forward into this current toolkit. Well, how can you access this? Well, you could actually go on to the ETF website and the link I showed you earlier early on. You can download this, make it your own, use your own branding. It's a Word document, so you can add and take away any of the toolkits that you don't think that are appropriate um, and um, make it your own and share this with your employers moving forward. So I hope you make use, uh, make use of that. Next slide, please. So over to Weston for a second. Sorry, I was on mute then. <laughs> so the, we've got a number, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a number of webinars coming up um, over the next uh, few months. We've actually scheduled these in till September, but I've just put the first three that are coming up um, just to, to highlight what's happening. So we've got a transition programme supporting learners with autism back into a college environment webinar on the 1st of July. Um, then we've got um, a guest speaker, Nick Elston, who's done an awful lot nationally with some key um, corporates and within the um, education sector around anxiety and um, building resilience. So we're really lucky to have him coming to talk to us um, on the 15th of July and then we've got a hot topic focus on ADHD and again supporting learners back into the college environment um, on the 29th of July so that's the next three that are coming up um, but as I mentioned uh, earlier we've also got a number of recordings on the ETF website from previous um, webinars that we've run the 17th of June we ran a hot topic session on um, virtual transition for learners with mental health and anxiety um, and then a mental health and welfare anxiety um, session on the 3rd of June. So please um, take a look at the, the ETF website. Um, we, if you want to, to sign up to any of the webinars that are coming up, let us know and we can make sure that you're sent a link to those. Thank you. Scott, do you want to click for me, please? So, um, as well as the ongoing leadership offer from Mandy, our immediate priority is really to try and um, put in place a monthly community of practice, very informal catch up on a Thursday. It'll be from four till five. And the idea is that it's an opportunity through Microsoft Teams to um, drop a question or to ask others in the 
uh, industry what they're doing and we, it will be a genuine sharing opportunity and also we can do some development work so i saw that somebody just put in the chat that they'd like stuff specifically around maintaining social distancing we've we've already got um, as i'm sure you all have we've already got some stuff that's been differentiated to several levels for some of our most complex students with really um uh, diff different communication needs right up to our kind of a level provision so if anybody wants to join those communities of practice or share this with practitioners working within their um, their teams if they could just drop us an email we'll invite them along to that um, we've got webinars coming up on um, CIAG and send specific CIAG and the reality of um, what that plan needs to look like for a young person to get them into work. We've also already done a webinar on EHCP reviews and generating support plans for those without EHCPs. That was really positive, so we're going to be repeating it. And then um, the other elements of, that we're offering we'll, were face to face, and we are hoping that we'll get to to do face-to-face -face sessions again, mainly because we do offer a fantastic lunch. And so it'd be really nice to actually see real people um, and for, for people to be able to come and look at um, one of our agricultural campuses. Um, and that's it for me. So I'm gonna hand you to Elaine. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide, okay, please. Sorry, I'm just interrupting a tiny bit. If we could just wrap up quickly, please, at this point, um, we're just running over a little bit. Of Go course. ahead, Elaine, go ahead. Next slide. Just click on all of these, please, Scott. Thank you. So this is what's coming up. But as I've said, and I won't um, keep clicking. Uh, I'm Scott. Thank you. I won't uh, delay further. Just check out the ETF website. So next slide. And I think that's it. I think we don't have any questions. Um, I think there's some uh, some items coming up in the chat, Pat, that we're picking up. So quite happily just to take questions offline if you want to move on thank you and thanks for okay I, I just think that was all splendid just splendid that um, you've given us so much in such a short time and I realize now we should have given you way more time so um, next time if you're good enough to grace us uh, with with further information um, at our next meeting we will certainly um, make sure that we've got the time in there it'd be a pleasure Pat Oh, thank you. It's thank just you. wonderful to see what's going on, actually, and to see it in, you know, all corners of the country, you know, um, uh, Norfolk and uh, Derby and um, uh, down in, in, in Western. It's really good. OK, um, if you've got any questions, colleagues, um, if you could um, post them on the chat, please, uh, for our colleagues, that would be really good. And if we could remove the presentation now, I understand we're going to Northampton College and uh, to my own team. And I don't know who's up first. I, I'm going to jump in, Pat, and That's start one the, of the problems. I never know what they're doing. I only find <laughs> out by news things or something, but they've always got something usually pretty exciting. So we pass over to Bev, please. Thank you. And um, how wonderful to be talking to around about 80 colleagues across the country. I'm going to introduce uh, the next presentation that will involve my colleague Mel McLean, the Curriculum Manager for Supported Learning at Northampton College, and Thomas Goodrich and Helen Janska, who run additional learning support for our wider college students. I'm the assistant principal who heads up ESOL Foundation and supported learning, by the way. So we'll talk about the two subjects there, specifically about our discrete provision. And Scott, if we could have the next slide, please. So uh, this may not be new for everybody. And, and the, the real intent of this presentation is just to give you an indication of what's worked for us as we felt our way through those very unexpected circumstances we suddenly found ourselves in. And two really clear points that I'm sure will chime with colleagues in, in this Zoom room is, is that clarity and consistency of communication. When guidance was changing every five minutes, it felt like in, in March and early April, we were very consistent in how we communicated with students and their caregivers around those changes. Um, going from risk assessments to keep students with the HPs to keep the HCPs off site, on site, all those changes. And then very much clear communication around how the curriculum was going to be delivered. And, and what worked very well for us was keeping it low tech initially, keeping some consistency there, business as usual, if you like, and then building on it and incrementally bringing in uh, online platforms and different approaches 
that I will actually now hand over to Mel, the curriculum manager, who will tell you all about that. Um, could we have the next slide, please, Scott, for Mel to talk to? Thanks, Bev. Hi, everybody. Um, as Bev said, my name's Mel. I'm the curriculum manager for the area. So this is really a glimpse of what's been happening at Northampton College and this is really where we started. So this was our sort of thinking behind how we were going to create um, some online and home learning community feel to the programme as it changed. So we really began to look at coursework. So we wanted it to feel accessible, but with teacher input, individual basis and that we had to ensure that we tracked it, the engagement was there and the connection was there and I think that word's been used quite a lot but it's really important and that there was transition involved because obviously as, as we progress through the weeks parents, carers, students alike have, have started to look at where they're moving to so if we can move to the next slide please Scott so this is kind of where we arrive this is the end point if you like of, of a lot of our work so we created um, some interactive online learning boards that we delivered through Google um, classroom but really this is a glimpse of how we set it out because what we learned very early on is that we needed to keep it very consistent very ordered and structured so that uh, students were able to follow it and more importantly as importantly parents and carers and those in the household were also following it too so we created a schedule um, from Monday through to Friday in terms of expectation because things as, you, as everybody said change at home you know the whole dynamics at home change so we needed to keep some order in terms of their timetable to that too. So we looked at math skills, English skills, our soft skills development, keeping an eye all the time on our EHCP targets and skills development. And then crucially, we also looked at health and wellbeing. And that really was part of where we, to create our home learning community. So this is kind of what the student was seeing every week in terms of expectations, some aspirations, some targets, but also to develop a dialogue and a conversation to make them feel connected and um, involved and still very much part of our college community and our supported learning community. So if we could have a look at the next um, slide, please. So this is um, just a very brief glimpse really of our week of our yoga if you like and, and we delivered that through uh, are delivering that through YouTube videos um, and staff and the whole team have been amazing in terms of putting together um, familiar faces um, familiar voices and, and, and a platform that enabled the, a student to sort of really connect with all that we were doing so if we can just sort of move on and this sort of underpins all of these um, all of these aspects that we first began to look at. So that's just a brief glimpse at our sort of our consistency approach. So if we just quickly um, move on to the next slide. So again, if we just focus on the middle part, which is the RAPA and soft skills development, we, we developed um, early on in the year throughout the academic year, our four corners of skills focus, which is independence, confidence, self-esteem and resilience. So most of what we've done with the students have, have all centered around that focus. So we began to sort of develop different um, engagement platforms for them to um, demonstrate independence, confidence, self-esteem and resilience. Because those things were quite low when, when the lockdown occurred and uh, there was no more um, traditional attendance of college, if you like. So if we could just move on. And again, if we just see that snapshot in the right corner. So this is where we were talking to students on a daily, weekly, um, a, an arranged schedule, all of the staff involved in terms of how their reflections in terms of independence, confidence, self-esteem and resilience. And really getting them to think about that either through um, online chat or through telephone conversations, through reflective Google forms. So really different levels of um, interaction that the student is able to A, manage, B, in, um, get involved and engaged with and also so that parents, parents were very involved in this whole process. So it's also about parent and carer involvement so they could see that their young person is still making progress. So the confidence in the college is maintained and, and the resilience of the programme is too. And again, I'm really, really proud to say we've had some really fab, fab feedback in terms of parent carer students. Um, and in terms of just, I think others have mentioned this too, that there have been you know, an amount of students that are really engaged in this and really enjoyed that, that independent connection. So again, as you say, building on all the things we've learned too. So if we could just get to the next one. 
And then alongside that, uh, in the background or in the foreground, if you like, we've also um, had online um, on-site provision and our teams have been working with small groups of students and, and our focus on that has been creative well-being activities. And if you just see there, I don't know if you can just make it out on the image, but they are all um, individual um, individual pieces of work that has come together to form a very large mural um, that's going to be very proudly displayed in the college, we hope. And, and again, students have been able to maintain that social interaction. One of our, one of our feedback um, headlines was that they really miss their friends and they really miss that interaction with staff and others and the confidence that that really gives and, 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 and how essential that college life is to that young person's development. So on many different forms, not just qualifications, but um, you know, making friends, developing social, um, external social um, events, if you like, through, with each other. So, and in no small part, I have to say, it's given us a really excellent dry run for 2021 reopening. So I, I feel the, the, the learning curve has been steep, <laughs> but also really enjoyable along the way. You know, that's at the heart of what we do to be back in college, to have students in the college, to, for the college to feel that it's working for the students. So we've, you know, we've learned an awful lot about hygiene measures, about social distancing, which is ongoing as everybody's probably experiencing, and just the reality of the available space. And, and it's really given all the support staff and the teaching staff a real insight to how we best use our college. How do we best use that? in terms of supporting and progressing students. So I think, although that's a very brief um, glimpse into to what we've been doing, um, if I hand back to Bev so that she can talk to you about our, our 2021. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks, Mel. Thank you. Could we have the next slide, Scott? So a, a brief overview, really, of how our approach to the next academic year is building on that lockdown experience. Clearly, bubbles are very much in the news and we are taking that approach very um, appropriately actually. We have a sector of the college that is accessible independently and you can see from the points there that our lockdown experience has really helped us to develop a routine that will work effectively for our students. What's interesting to point out is we are continuing to build in a blended learning approach. It's worked remarkably well as Mel has said for a great proportion of our students, we've learnt lessons from it. Um, approximately 75%, 25% at the moment, which, which may be of interest to colleagues in the room. Um, external work experience clearly is an important part of what we offer at the college. Clearly it's a little bit in um, a, an area of uncertainty at the moment. So for now, we are focusing on developing internal work related projects and skills development opportunities for students whilst our external work experience uh, contacts get back into the workplace, develop their own expertise, and we can pick up those links again. And the final point really from our discrete provision is how we have approached that cohort of students who were moving into wider college provision. Um, my colleagues from the wider college will tell you a little bit about their approach in a moment, but we have taken approach with these students to develop a bespoke transition course for them this year, working with them, because let's face it, our wider college experience will look very different to what they were expecting. So practically, we are focusing on securing their progression, securing their ongoing learning and progress towards their targets, be they EHCP targets, preparation for adulthood targets, whatever, through continuing to work within the, under the umbrella of supportive learning, our discrete provision, with increasing vocational skills builders with a view to them transitioning into our wider college provision when the COVID situation has, we hope, resolved itself or is more immediately manageable for them. So, if I could hand over to my colleagues Thomas and Helen, who have the responsibility of our wider college support, and I'll tell you about their experiences. Hello everyone. Um, Scott, could I have the slides? The next slide, please. It is the following slide, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of... Um, uh, uh, overview of where we were with the wider college. Um, so 
I want to just give you a flavour of where we were um, and where we found ourselves. So once um, Northampton College um, moved to remote delivery, we found ourselves with um, 140 high needs students in various study programmes across the college, 54 students with, with plans that didn't have access to high needs funding. And then on top of that, um, a large number of students with SEND all um, around the college. We had a, we've got a large LS team and we've got around 65 learning support assistants, all with varying various levels of digital skills. So at that time, not being a man of faith, I was quite surprised when I found, my, found myself praying. <laughs> so we were really lucky and our salvation was actually that we got some quite clear um, leadership um, messages coming down about what the expectations were of students um, and the students were going to be expected to engage with their programs until the end of their until the end of the year which was really helpful for us because we could then um, reinforce that expectation in terms of the support services that we that we had um, so the first week we we were kind of trying to get everything in place. We didn't know what we were doing, to be honest, um, but actually taking laptops to staff's houses and making sure that all of the learning support assistants could engage with their timetables digitally, because there was, I was not gonna give them the excuse basically to not engage with their timetables because we needed to make sure these students had uh, the support. And um, what we found has been quite interesting is actually um, how communication has been key um, in terms of um, the local authority, um, students, parents and carers, but also how we've had to connect things. So it was really, really important that whilst our support staff were on the ground supporting these students, they had a very simple way of flagging students that they were having difficulties engaging with so that they could continue with their programmes but that information could come through to um, Helen and myself and that we could make sure that that was sent out to the curriculum areas and the ALS specialists that kind of oversee their support packages. We wanted to make sure that we've done that. What's also been really interesting, particularly with our support staff roles, is there's been a real change in kind of the team. So some support assistants that may have thrived in the classroom and have been really, really strong They've struggled a little bit with working remotely and yet we've got support assistants that perhaps were new to the college or needed some development and yet they've absolutely risen to the challenge and their digital skills we've been able to exploit um, for the students. So the real thing there has been about tenacity and we're, we're really hoping that we're going to be able to draw on that and actually start to create some um, LSAs that will champion um, different kinds of digital platforms because one thing that we did find was the really, really valuable was giving staff their own Google Classroom. They were interacting with it with students and they were Skyping students and they were emailing students and that was working really well. But actually, the quickest way was for them to upskill each other because they were quite a large team. So the peer support there um, was really, really helpful. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, what we've done um, through um, lockdown and to help prepare us for 2021 is we've actually got what we, me and Helen, call Operation Call Centre. And this has been absolutely um, invaluable. So we've used it at various points during lockdown. And if we look at the, the, the slides that Liz showed us, and it's really, really powerful to see what we've all been through as a journey. Um, at, at certain points when guidance came out, we closed down and we we changed our service and we turned it into a call center so we, we did it the first time when we would um we went into lockdown we needed to make sure that the students were safer at home and that their needs were being met to identify any for our vulnerable um student program then we went into a more i want to say formal risk assessment process where we um created telephone scripts and the, the staff actually went through with the students all of the questions that we needed to to find out from them um, and also one of the things that we really wanted to look at was the devices they had um, and also what kind of barriers they faced during remote learning and that includes new students that are are going to be new to us in September because in their current settings we need to know have they got a laptop have they got a smartphone have they got 
have they got um, cameras and uh, microphones? Um, and actually, if we know now where they've struggled, and we do have already have that information, um, that's actually been sent out to the Quicken team so that they can actually see that. And we've also um, asked you about medical conditions because we really need to make sure that we are considering um, any situations that they're in, in in terms of bringing them back into college and that's going to be a very very cautious and considered um, process. Um, in terms of communication with stakeholders we have continually developed, we are trying to drip feed into our um, into stakeholders what college might look like in September um, trying to let them know that actually we will be supporting you. We're going to be looking at some Zoom events over the summer, particularly for those on the spectrum, um, that we can actually start um, talking to them about actually how support's going to look, seeing if we can get some on site in a very, in a, in a very cautious way. Um, communication with local authorities. Now that has been interesting and I think that what's worked for us there is just letting them know everything that we are doing so that their requests from us remain reasonable and have perspective. And then the last thing that I want to talk about or just quickly mention, and that's something that we're currently working on at the moment, is responding to the very com complex picture of how each curriculum area is going to be designing their delivery for next year. Um, that's something that we're going to have to look at. And again, that's about managing expectations because there is only so much resource. And if we have a lot of small groups, we might have to really think about how we're going to tackle that. And also some areas are saying, actually, we want to manage our students, but when they do their remote delivery, we really want the support to be there, to keep an eye on those students, to be calling them, to be checking in on them. So that's going to be a really complex task because each area is going to have different requirements. And each, as we all know, each student is gonna have, have their own and requirements too. So they're kind of, that's a whistle-stop tour of the things that we've done and what we're looking to do. Um, and of course, um, if anyone does have any questions, um, just um, put them through and um, we'll answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas and Bev and Mel. Um, are we hearing anything from Helen or Thomas, were you talking for Helen and yourself? I think Helen might have been. Oh, go on, Helen. Yeah, Tom has covered everything that we needed to say. Okay. Um, just conscious that we are sort of a minute from closing the meeting, but I'd like to extend it for those of you that can stay, just to mop up and to hear um, what, what about exam considerations. So I think, again, you know, this isn't just about EHCPs. This is about, you know, um, disadvantaged groups and exam considerations. Now, Helen, you put this on the agenda. Would you like to just air what your concerns were and then we'll take that forward if there's any questions on the presentations you please put them in the chat or i'll give you a chance to raise your hand in in a while but let's go on to exam considerations yeah i was just conscious thinking about how um with the two meter social distancing how we're going to effectively make to get, be able to cope with the volume of assessments that are needed and i just want to be able to sort of pick people's brains in terms of like good any good practice um are people looking to go on to online assessments, people got experience of online assessments, and what tools are people thinking of using? So I know we're looking at maybe doing the SDMT, um, the Towery2, the Tomal, uh, things that are quick and snappy and that, that can be done with all safety measures. You know, we're going to be looking at laminating resources, using face visors, gloves. We're going to designate one special room, one room that will only be used for EAA, that will be cleaned after every use. So it was mainly just, just trying to get a feel from other colleagues what their approaches are going to be come September. If anyone's got anything they want to share. Can't see any anybody. Um. Can I just come in no, quickly? Um, Tess sure. Zen, who is at AOC, has been dealing with exams and has been doing a lot of work, particularly on the assessment for vocational qualifications, which need close contact, like hair and beauty, etc. Is that the sort of thing you're thinking of? Yes, yeah. Um, it's, it's listen, it's Tess, who has far more information on that than me, um, if you email me, yeah. I'll forward any queries yes. to Cass and get her yes. to get back to you. Okay. Thank you. 
Liz, I've got a meeting with Kath. I'll pick it up. Oh, with okay. You I just actually up. thought, just as Helen was talking, I thought, actually, this is one for AOC to yeah. raise with each awarding body and the general council. Um, just to say they are already doing that, Pat. But if you're okay. talking with Kath, you will find. Kath has been uh, talking with awarding bodies endlessly. Yeah. And it's the general council we'll need relaxing on, won't we? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, okay. uh, it is underhand, but it's not my particular area. Okay. Yeah. So, so will you deal with that, Pat? Will you deal with Kath? Yeah, happy okay. to do that. Um, Fine. Liz, um, I understand uh, what um, Kath will be up against there. That, um, yes. She is. <laughs> <laughs> we have team meetings every afternoon oh, and she's no, come I off the phone with one awarding body or another. So, so I think, um, colleagues, obviously that one seems to have passed uh, uh, by a lot of you and I can understand why because you're busy, but obviously it's one for thinking about, it's one for scenario planning, and you've also got to think about the fact that students may well have been out of um, formal education. Some of the students that we will be looking for exam consideration um, since March. So your reading ages will have dropped, um, writing speeds, all the rest of it. So that's something to, to look at. OK, um, we were uh, when we talked about our college, we talked about reopening plans. Just like to give anybody else an opportunity if they'd like to talk about their um, reopening plans for September to share or any concerns that they've got. Can I share something on examinations? Mm -hmm. yes. Sorry, just going back to your original question, I'm going to take my hand. Hold on. Um, I just put a note in the um, chat because I was aware that um, a lot of students will be choosing to take their GCSEs in their um, secondary schools. They may wish to take some GCSEs, but obviously the colleges are still responsible for maths and English if they have to retake um, within their new institutions. Um, and therefore, Nick Lit has confirmed that all um, scanned documents are acceptable um, for rolling forward any feeder schools that you have for form eights. So the hopefully the assessment process uh, will be better. I know I've contacted all my uh, feeder schools to confirm what I need from them very early on in September for any retake in November or whenever that might be. Um, there's another thing that's gone out of my head. Oh yes, um, with regard to what, what uh, tests and things that you may need to do for new students who haven't had exam arrangements before, I'm just using the guidance that came through from PATOS. Um, I'm a dyslexia assessor as well, so I'm just using their guidance that they use for um, all dyslexia assessments and disabled student allowance. Uh, for university, there's a very uh, specific guidance on that, on what you can do and what you can't do for one-to-one face-to-face -one, uh, -face assessments, which are entirely relevant for exam access arrangements, because many of the assessments are the same. So I don't know if that's um, helpful or anybody's got any comments on that. That's really helpful, and actually technology doesn't work really, just that I said it did, because I missed it, and obviously you've all, all got questions here, so I think we'll stay on this topic. Um, yeah, it's the SAS guidelines. Somebody's saying let's get it up there. That's it. I couldn't remember the interview. Are you saying that um, the JCQ guidelines were going to change? I haven't seen anything, but we'll pick that up with Kath at the AOC. She can maybe champion us for that. And um, oh, other people have, Elaine's got a, a comment. Anybody else got anything? So Pat, it's Elaine. I'll share the yeah, guidelines with yeah. you to, to send out afterward if that's helpful. I, yeah, I was actually quite, quite, I felt quite reassured reading through those. So um, uh, yeah, I'll pass those over. Okay, so lots of people sharing here. This is really good. Uh, obviously, one to think about then, and and a huge a huge task. It's a normally huge task, but probably a bigger task um, coming this year. Yeah. Okay. Pat, I, I think there's a question from Lee in the chat um, and he's wondering if people have concerns about virtual support and safeguarding. Okay, can we just close off the exam consideration? <coughs> yes, okay, thank you. Uh, can we go back to Lee's point about safeguarding and support virtual? 
Um, just to say that one of the webinars that AOC did was on safeguarding on online. So have a look at that. There were several organizations involved, in, including Prevent, et cetera, talking there. So I think that will give you quite a lot of um, initial information about that, because yes, it is an issue. And the feedback we are getting um, is that, uh, you know, that certainly um, use of online gambling, et cetera, has gone up enormously. And we, 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 you know, colleges have to be aware of that. But there are guidelines on the AOC website too on some of the safety steps you can take in working online. Very simple things like, you know, if they're under 18, of course, get permission of parents. You could record the session, et cetera. So there are some guidelines on the AOC website. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring the meeting to a close now, unless there's any other conversations you want to bring in. Um, uh, Norwich, I was just going to say that um, I think we've, when we're looking at some of our uh, policies, we're talking about safeguarding, I think we've all got a part to play with updating our policies with the current procedures for staff yeah. and for students. Um, so we're working our way through those. So I think that's something that perhaps another webinar that we could look at, perhaps. That would be very useful. I was going to ask the question, did people find this meeting useful? And would we like another one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think of the time and what we would put in that topic. So if you could put topics to Scott, please, in time. But I am thinking that if we could get somebody from Patos or um, the J JCQ um, to come and talk to us, uh, you know, they're reaching out to a lot of colleges, so that would be useful. So we'd have more of a focus on cross-college learning support perhaps mm -hmm. next time and um, safeguarding. So they're two topics. Um, and then we'll have to work out who can do what, because um, I... Um, I'm very conscious that we've got some very good practitioners here in the room and we do need to share good practice and I'd like then another college perhaps to offer um, some some of topics from from their from their college and and take that forward you're in safe hands here you can't go wrong any information you share will be used um, for the good of, of the students so are we happy with that approach I don't think we'll get one in at the end before the summer i was thinking early september i know that's a busy time but does early september work for people yep okay we'll canvas we'll, um, scott could we canvas some dates if we get that in early i know it's a busy time but perhaps it's better that we do it end of august early september so that actually we've got some sharing and some information that we can give out and if we find information meanwhile please do share it with through scott is that the correct way scott can we can we get it shared among the group yeah that's absolutely fine elaine if you wanted to um send the documents you're going to send to pat then i can circulate them to the group for pat um and we'll do a doodle like we did last time in terms of working out what's the yeah. best date and, and yeah we so suggested that we maybe get from nick late something so you know there's yeah. lots of suggestions here and that's what we want we want this group to to galvanize um action and ensure equality at this time okay i thank you all for coming i thank you for all the participants i think it's been one of our best meetings meetings to date and if you you know have topics no matter how difficult they might be let's try and challenge them okay Hi. just before we go your mps hello libby Hi, I just wanted to ask if um, you were able to please send us the recorded uh, webinar from today and the resources, please. Yeah, they'll be uh, sent out um, either later today or first thing tomorrow. Um, we just need to download the video and then do a bit of editing before we send it out. Yeah, it and if you've, got, if you've got um, a sign up uh, like for us to to add our emails to so you can be on, we can be on your contact list, that'd be good as well. Yeah, that's fine. Everyone that's attended today will get everything and they'll find out about the next meeting as well. Thank okay, you. So, anyone else? Yeah. Okay, I just want to thank our speakers. I want to thank my own team, Scott, for arranging this and obviously Liz for coming. I think it's been really useful. Best of luck to you. Do not forget to get those MP letters out. Get them out now. We need some money. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Pat. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.